Hello and welcome to another MetroTech's recorded webisode. The association is very privileged to have with us today Danny Hardiman, 2012 President of the Dallas Chapter of the National Association of Residential Property Managers. Danny also serves on the MetroTech's Leasing and Property Management Committee and is President of Blue Crown Properties. Danny is one of the instructors presenting in our newly developed Texas Certified Property Manager Certification. Danny's presentation today is entitled, It's Just a Lease, Think Again. Thank you, sir, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about leasing, and the title of this presentation is, It's Just a Lease, Think Again. Why did I choose that title? The reason why is as a property manager, we get that comment all the time from agents. They all think that, oh, it's just a lease, it's no big deal. When in actuality, there's a lot more pitfalls and what I call bear traps you can step in when you're putting a lease together, especially if you're not educated on how to put together leases. So today, we're gonna cover quite a few topics on that subject. We're gonna talk about how to ensure you get paid and aren't wasting your time when you're representing tenants. Um, if you have sellers and their house isn't selling, seller considerations if they're contemplating leasing. These are very important things that you definitely need to share with your sellers before they decide that they want to put their house up for lease. And then also we're going to address um, a few of the do's and don'ts of property management. A lot of people that I'm sure out there listening today are considering adding this um, to your tool belt and you need to make sure that you are aware of what you can and cannot do as it pertains to property management as a licensed individual. Okay, what we're going to start with are questions to ask before scheduling a showing with a tenant. Okay, so you're the agent representing a prospective tenant who would like to present an application on one of our properties for lease. These are all the things that you need to think about and you should ask every single person that, you, um, that approaches you as far as representing them in a lease transaction. The first question you should ask prospective tenants is, have you given written notice to your current landlord? That's always very important. If you have no idea where they stand in an existing lease, they could still be 30, 60, 90, some people are even 120 days out from the end of their lease. So that's very important to ensure that you're not wasting your time by representing someone that I can tell you we are not going to approve because we are not going to hold a property for that long length of time when we could have it occupied much sooner. So make sure you ask anybody, hey, have you given your written notice to your current landlord and when exactly is, that, is your lease ending? When do you need to move? That's always a no-brainer, but it's good to know so you can make sure that you present the best picture possible to the uh, co-broker. Let's just say I am the, the broker leasing the house or listing the house for lease and you're dealing with me. Um, that is a good thing we need to know. If you have any flexibility as far as your move date, can you take possession, say, a week earlier or does it need to be a week later than what we're listing as the, the date of availability? Another question that you need to ask tenants is, what's the maximum you want to pay? Now that's very important because tenants, a lot of them don't realize that you know, you want to keep them in the three to one range of three times, you want their income to be three times what the monthly rent is going to be. So their monthly gross income should be at least three times what the listed rent amount is. Um, that's to ensure that they can pay the rent and all other bills on top of that. So you need to set expectations with the tenant that if their maximum they want to pay is not in line with their income, uh, set expectations of what where they need to be to make sure that they're going to get approved uh, from the landlord. Do you have pets? This is always a very, very important subject, especially if they've got aggressive breed dogs. Um, a lot of our property owners today have actual clauses in their insurance policies that uh, specifically prohibit certain breeds of aggressive dogs. So that is a major obstacle we're going to have to overcome in the application process. So you need to know what they have you know, and how many they have as well. Um, so make sure that you are asking that question. Um, one word of advice is a lot of people that have 
quote, aggressive breed dogs, in particular pit bulls, will typically say that, well, I just have a mixed breed dog. Now that is a red flag to us because if they're saying mixed breed dog, we just always assume it's a pit bull. So you need to make sure that you have good clarification of what kind of pets. And if there's any doubt, tell them to take a picture of the dog. You can send a picture of the dog along with the lease application to us, and that will help us determine if we're going to be able to, to get that animal approved to be on site at the property. How long do you expect to stay in the property? That's always a good one because don't always just assume that if you have a tenant that is applying for one of our properties, that all other tenants applying for that property are just going after a 12-month lease. You know, there could be people coming to us with 24-month lease offers or longer or shorter or 18-month lease offers. Um, so you need to find that out. Most of our properties owners are not interested in lease terms under 12 months. Um, so you need to take that into consideration if you have somebody that's only looking for uh, you know, a short-term rental because that's really going to cut down on the pool of available properties, especially in this hot leasing market today. And here's a very important one. Do you or any other occupants smoke? I know a lot of you may feel uncomfortable asking these questions, but these are all very relevant questions. Uh, if you put yourself in the shoes of the property owner, there are a lot of property owners out there that do not want smokers in their property just because of the expense to make that property ready <coughs> Excuse me, after a, uh, a smoker has vacated the property. So you need to know that and you need to tell them to be honest about that because if they're not, we do our background check and check with a former landlord who says they did smoke in there, you're going to be automatically declined for failing to disclose that. And here's a really good one as well, and it'll help you save yourself some time too when you're trying to help them locate a property, is what do you consider your must-have options on a property? And here are some examples. If it's, say, a condominium, do you want covered parking? Um, if it's a, you know, a two-story house, do you have to have the, the master bedroom on the first floor? Is that a requirement of yours? Do you have to have a fence yard? Do you have any you know, qualms about properties with pools? Do you want a pool? Don't want a pool? You know, a lot of those type of variables. So if you could just ask them, you know, what are your must-haves? What are the things that you absolutely need to have in this property? We'll save yourself as an agent quite a bit of time. And here is one of the most important issues is what background issues must we overcome to get you approved? And here's all the things, the negative things that could affect getting your applicant approved. Evictions, bad credit, foreclosure, bankruptcies, late payments, criminal history, basically anything negative that's going to come up on a background check. Um, you need to ask them. They need to be brutally honest because it will come up. So um, it's always good that you understand what we're going to, the obstacles we're going to have to overcome and also prepare the tenant about how, what it's going to take to get you approved if you have some of those issues on your background. A lot of our owners will request additional deposit, sometimes a double deposit. I've seen triple deposits before. Um, so you need to prepare them in the event that they apply for a certain property and they do have you know, an eviction or bad credit or foreclosure, that they're prepared to pay additional deposit because they are a higher risk applicant. And here is the biggest no-brainer question, which it seems most people have the hardest time asking tenants is do you actually have any money? That is very, very important. They could answer all these questions glowingly, have a great application, we get them approved, we're ready for them to give us their deposit and their rent, and they don't have any money. They have to wait a month to get it, or you know, they'll get it on their next paycheck. <laughs> that is huge, and if they do not have any money, then you are basically spinning your wheels if you're trying to represent this person, because we don't consider a property off the market until we've got a fully executed lease and a security deposit and cleared funds in our hands. Until both of those things have been done, that property is available for everyone. We are currently in a red hot rental market, so if they don't have all their ducks in a row, you can be pretty sure that your client is going to lose this property to another applicant if they're not ready to officially close the deal and get that property off the market. So don't be afraid to ask any of these questions. You know, I know a lot of these, to your, you may be thinking to yourself, are uncomfortable questions to ask, but they're not much different than 
if you have been doing sales for the majority of your career, um, they're just things that you do need to know and you need to be prepared because you're going to have a few obstacles to overcome in getting your person approved. So in summary, don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. It's going to save you loads of time and it's going to save you money because time is money. Gas is money. Opening the doors for properties is, is money. So you know, just ask these questions up front. Do a little pre-screening to see if it's somebody you want to represent and then go forward accordingly. Okay, what we're going to cover now are these are some things that you should cover with a tenant that is beginning this process. Okay, um, In most cases, you need to let them know, and this is for your benefit as well, that the property manager or the listing broker is going to prepare the lease. This may sound like a no-brainer to, to many of you out there. However, I can tell you that we have received lease applications in the past from a licensed person that has the full TAR lease application and then behind the, the lease application that agent has taken the liberty to draft a lease like it is, I guess, a sales contract. I've never understood the logic behind that, but it happens more than you think. So you need to understand that 99.99% of the time we will be the ones that are drafting the lease. The lease application if you're not familiar with the TAR lease application, you do need to look it over and get very comfortable with it. Um, you need to ensure that that application is completed in its entirety and is legible. Now this goes back to the title of our, our presentation today. Most people just say, oh, it's just a lease, it's no big deal. Well, actually it is a huge deal because we have to treat every application, every individual, exactly the same. That is why we want every single blank filled out. We don't want anything left blank. We need everything to be legible because we need to verify every single thing on that application. So ensure that your, uh, your tenant is completing it legibly. Um, a lot of you out there probably utilize DocuSign. That's a great way to get them to type it in rather than just scribble it in because most applicants are very dismissive about you know, how critical this information is. When it is huge, where one number is wrong can get an application you know, rejected. Um, if there's some places on the TAR lease application that, that are not applicable, go ahead and tell them to put an NA in there. That means they at least filled in the blank, okay? We don't want anything blank on this document once it's presented to us. All adults over the age of 18 need to submit an application. Even if only one says he wants to be listed as the tenant and the rest are just the occupants. Anybody over the age of 18 has to submit a completed application. That is very, very important information. If you're representing a family, um, this scenario comes up a few times um, where there is a child that is 18 years old. They could still be maybe a senior in high school or um, you know, a college freshman living at home. They don't understand why they, the applicants don't understand why that person has to complete a, an application. Well, it's because they are considered an adult. Okay, so if they are 18 or older, even if they're a child, they have to fill out an application as well. And it must be completed in its entirety, just like all other applicants. Um, you need to review the leasing requirements and instructions that the property management company has provided to you or the property owner um, to make sure that you understand exactly what documentation you're going to have to gather for that applicant to ensure you've got a completed file. Um, so that's very important information, and, and if you make that phone call up front, um, if you're utilizing MLS, a lot of property management companies will put their instructions in there for you, or they've got them on their website. But if you have any questions, pick up the phone and call them, and find out exactly what they need. Because if you submit an incompleted file, they're probably just going to send it straight back to you, and more likely than not, there's another applicant that's come in, and you're going to lose that property. So to ensure that doesn't happen, make sure you know exactly what you need to have um, and get it right the first time. Okay, full disclosure and honesty on the application is a must. And that is 100% true. You just need to make sure that you tell your client, the tenant, that they need to be brutally honest on this application because everything is going to be verified. It's, it's all going to come out in the wash. It's going to come out in the background check. It's going to call out, come out when talking to previous landlords. 
I would strongly to advise them not to put their best friend as their former landlord's name and phone number because we can snip that out as well. Um, so make sure that they are completely honest when filling out that lease application. You need to educate tenants that the application fee, security deposit, pet deposit, first month's rent need to be in certified funds payable to the PM company or the owner. And you'll get instructions from you know, the, the, the property management company or the, the listing broker in that situation. Um, the reason for that is, is, is there are very few firms that are going to allow you to present personal checks uh, because they don't want to legally hand over possession to a property and then have that first check balance. So it's most people's uh, 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 situation or protocol where they will take cleared funds in the in form of a certified check, money order, uh, online payment solutions, whatever is um, being utilized by that property management company or that owner. So make sure that you tell them that up front and they're not going to be writing personal checks until they move into the property. Once they have possession, then they can they can start writing personal checks. Um, they need to make sure that they're going to have a legible and clear cop copy of some sort of identification along with the application so we can prove that who is presenting this application is actually that person. And like I said earlier, a complete and well-organized file will give you a leg up on the competition in securing a property. And that is huge in today's market. The market is so hot right now, um, as you may have experienced yourself, properties are just flying off the market in record time and you can miss one in a matter of minutes if you're not getting us a complete complete file right off the bat. Okay, what we're going to go over now um, are some of the lease highlights. Um, if you're not familiar with the Texas Association of Realtors or TAR lease document, that's what the majority of agents and property management companies utilize in the state of Texas. Um, it, it's TAR Form 2001, if you've never seen it before. I strongly recommend you get out there and um, educate yourself on the document, read through the document, um, so you, you have a good feel for it, so you can explain uh, certain relevant points to your tenant during this process. What I'm going to cover right here is just a few of the highlights from the TAR lease. Um, so we're going to start with Section 4 of the lease. That section highlights the renewal and the termination requirements, how you formally terminate, you know, that you're not renewing the lease at the end. These are important things that you need to um, tell your tenant, you know, when they are going through the lease signing process, how to renew and how to properly terminate that lease. Section 5 of the TAR lease goes over the prorated rent amounts, rent amount and the due date for that. So I will tell you that the majority of property management companies require you to pay a full month's rent upon getting your keys to the property, regardless of what day of the month you take possession of that property. And then typically the second month would be the prorated month. So for example, say you take possession on the 15th day of the month, thinking that, well, I'm just going to bring my prorated rent to get the keys. Well, that's not correct. What you're going to need to bring is a full month's rent on that day and then the lease will be drafted so that your second month would be the prorated rent amount. So basically you're just flip-flopping month one and two. Section six of the TAR lease um, goes over the date late, fee late fees are incurred. Um, that is something that you definitely, to nef definitely need to make uh, your client aware of. Um, I don't know of very many professional property management fir firms that do waive late fees. So those clauses are very, very important to make sure that your clients are getting their rent in on a timely manner to avoid incurring any late charges. Um, it's also listed in Section 6 that the, post bar, the postmark is not the date the payment is actually received by the landlord. There are still a few tenants out there that have the misconception that if the postmark, if they're mailing a payment in, that the postmark is the date that we look at in, relate, in relation to late fees being charged. Well, that's not true. That's just the day you dropped it in the mail. That doesn't have anything to do with the day we received the payment. So if you drop it in the mail on the wrong day thinking it's correct and we get it three or four days later, you've got, you know, up to, you know, you've got a few days of late fees there that you've incurred. So make sure they understand that, that the postmark is not the day we actually received it and late fees can be charged. 
Okay, in section 11 of the TAR lease, that's the list of items that can be legally deducted from a security deposit. Um, there's also a link in that section that goes to property code, which will allow you to see anything that can be you know, rightfully deducted from a security deposit at the end of the lease. Um, section 12 of the TAR lease, this is very important information here, especially when you're looking at a roommate situation. Um, in this section are going to be authorized occupants of the unit. So basically everybody that is authorized to live in the property is going to be listed in this section. So you need to make them aware that they cannot change roommates without approval of the landlord. And that's typically going to trigger another lease application because it is going to be basically a completely new tenant. So it's very important if, if they expect to have any additions um, as far as roommates goes or subtractions of roommates that they do notify the landlord. So make sure you educate your client on that clause. Okay, section 15 of the TAR lease, um, this goes over repairs. Now if the tenant is requesting repairs um, prior to moving into the property, okay, so say you've got a lease application and um, you've got a tenant that wants a property and say you want a ensure that you know a certain room is painted a certain color and the landlord's agreed to it. Well you obviously want that in writing. Okay, so um, it, this lease is probably being generated prior to that repair being done um, or that re repair that maintenance issue being taken care of. So in this section of the lease you can actually have that written into the lease document that that will be done. Okay. Um, don't assume that if you see a property prior to make ready being done on it, that everything is going to be exactly how you're expecting it to be. Okay, everybody has a little bit different view of what a complete make ready is. Um, so if there's nothing listed here, then your tenant, your your client is basically agreeing to take the property in an as-is condition. Okay, so just make sure that if there's important items that you want to make sure are done that they are listed in this section of the lease. Section 18, this goes over repair requests. Um, all repair requests that are not emergencies must be made in writing per the TAR lease. Um, so it says check this section to see if there are any items the owner will not repair. Um, typically you'll see there's a few blanks in that section that says owner will not repair blank. Sometimes you'll see owners that will put certain appliances in there, say if they're supplying a washer and a dryer, um, sometimes I'll list a refrigerator there. Um, if you're leasing any of the properties that we manage, we advise our owners never put anything there because if they're, if they're providing it, we fully expect them to maintain it. Um, but if it is, you know, sometimes there'll be a situation where there'll be a house where there'll be a washer and dryer that an old tenant left. That it's not even the owner's property, but he's happy to provide it to the next tenant. So, in that scenario, the owner would list, you know, washer and dryer that was left at the property is not warrant. We're not warranting it, and we're not going to repair it if it breaks down. Um, so, make sure you check that section to see if anything anything is listed there. Uh, section twenty eight of the lease. Ensure the tenant understands any early termination penalties. So that section will go over what penalties they'll incur if they need to break the lease early. So go over that with them. Um, there's, there's a section in there that goes over if the tenant finds a replacement tenant or if the owner slash owner's rep, you know, property manager finds a tenant. And there could be different amounts based upon who, who locates the new tenant. Now in that situation, if you read that section closely, you will realize that the owner is not obligated to find or assist in finding a replacement tenant. They may or may not do so. So if for any reason your client needs to terminate early, first thing they need to do is pick up the phone and, and contact the property management company or the owner and, go, and start working toward that, that process to see what exactly is going to be done. Okay, section 34F. This is something that is always missed when we're doing lease signings, and it's a very, very important uh, section of the TAR lease. Um, ensure the tenant names someone not living at the property in this section. What that section covers is in the event of all the tenants that are over the age of 18 that are on that lease, if they all die during the term of that lease, 
um, the person listed here would be the person allowed to enter the property, remove the tenant's personal belongings, and receive their itemization of their security deposit. So a lot of people don't even read this section and they just throw their own name down there, which you can't, <laughs> I can't have you enter our property if you're the person that is the occupant and has passed away. So make sure they understand that and pick somebody that they know and trust to put in that section of the lease. Okay, and as far as the pet agreement, um, as far, in, in regards to the TAR lease, you need to clarify if there is a pet that has been approved, you know, clarify if it's refundable or if it's a non-refundable pet fee. You know, the di difference between a pet deposit and a non-refundable pet fee. All that stuff is laid out in the pet agreement. And finally, when you do submit an application in the entire packet, make sure that you're providing your broker's W-9 form and the agreement between brokers along with the application. Why? Because that facilitates you getting paid. Um, we cannot cut a check if you get us a, a tenant until we have those two things. So don't delay. Um, my firm will cut you a check within 24 hours. Um, if we've got everything we need. But again, I can't cut you a check until I have these two things. So make sure that you do submit that along with your packet right off the bat. Okay, so let's shift gears now. Uh, say you're representing a seller and you've just got a property and it just will not sell. The, tenant, the owner is getting frustrated. You need to, to figure out an alternate solution for them. So it might be an appropriate time for you to educate them on leasing their property and some of the things that they may not have thought about as far as leasing. It's not as easy as just throwing a sign in the yard. The first thing you need to do is have them talk to their insurance company of their intentions to lease the property because your property would go from an owner-occupied uh, policy to what's called a, a Texas dwelling policy or a fire policy and that's for tenant-occupied property in the state of Texas. So you need to make sure they educate their, themselves on that policy, how much it's going to cost, and there may be some questions asked by the insurance company as well. But that's something that needs to be done first, even before a tenant takes possession. Don't wait until a tenant takes possession to begin this conversation, uh, because once those keys are handed over to somebody else, if your policy is not in place, say that house burns down on the first night, you're not going to have any coverage. You also need to make them aware that they're going to have to make some modifications to the security devices on the house because once it's tenant-occupied property, it has to be in compliance. There are no exceptions to this. So you need to make them aware that all exterior doors will need to comply with Texas Property Code. That will require keyless deadbolts. You need to have keyless locking devices on all doors to the outside. That would be front door, back door, and that even includes the door from the house that goes into the garage. Um, that's very critical information. Um, those doors also need to have peepholes unless there is a clear pane of glass or you know, a one-way mirror um, so you can clearly see who is outside. There are no exceptions to these requirements. And again, these do include the doors that go from the house to the garage. So all these doors are going to need to be in compliance. They will also need to have the house rekeyed in addition to having these security devices. Um, even if they were occupying the house, the law still requires it to be rekeyed. There is also, if you go out to YouTube, there is an excellent video out there. It's a 10 minute video that, that will allow you to educate yourself on security devices in the state of Texas. Um, if you go out to YouTube, just type in Texas Property Code Locks or Texas Property Code Chapter 92. There is a 10 minute video by Ken Jennings of Mr. Rekey or Texas Rekey that goes over Texas property code, has pictures of all these different types of locks to make sure you're in compliance. You can educate yourself with that video, but you can also send that link to your clients as well. It's a wonderful video. In fact, I show it in, in the class I teach here at Metro Tex, um, the maintenance class on making sure everybody understands the different types, types of locks to make sure they're in compliance. Um, all bedrooms and hallways feeding bedrooms must have smoke detectors. Again, no exceptions to that. You must be in full compliance with that. If it's a two-story house, you also have to have a, a minimum of one smoke detector per floor in addition to having all the bedrooms and the hallways feeding those bedrooms with smoke detectors. 
if there's a gas furnace or any you know gas appliances in the house, if it's going to be tenant occupied, we strongly recommend installing carbon monoxide detectors. Um, it's a very very cheap investment, and it's just one more thing to minimize your liability as a as a landlord. Um, the last thing you want on your hands is a dead tenant or a dead family in your house that didn't wake up from a heater or a furnace that malfunctioned. So strongly recommend to your clients that they do put in a carbon monoxide detector. Even though those are not required by Texas Property Code, it's just a liability, a way to minimize risk and liability. Also, this is something they need to remember as well, their homestead exemption on their property taxes is ultimately going to fall off. So they need to prepare themselves that their property taxes are going to go up if they, if they rent out their property. So make sure they're prepared for that. And they need to also start creating a reserve account or what we call a rainy day fund, you know, if, because things break. You know, there's, there's different maintenance issues and you can never predict when they're going to happen. Um, but they definitely need to be prepared to pay for repairs as they come up. Sometimes when they live in the property, they could, you know, just kind of live with the inconvenience. But when it's tenant-occupied property, you do need to act immediately. Um, a good rule of thumb, you know, you can tell them to put sock away 10 to 20 percent of their gross rents annually. You know, depending on the condition of the property, the age of the property, um, that's a good rule of thumb. It may err on the high side, but you never know what, when a high ticket item is going to go out. So make sure they are prepared that they are going to have repair issues. And here's a good question that they just need to ask themselves. You know, can you financially survive if the rent's not paid? You know, as a property manager, we're always thinking worst case scenario. Um, I'm always assuming a tenant's not going to pay rent until they pay rent. So you need to be prepared for that. Um, if there is a you know, disruption in your income stream, if a tenant fails to pay us rent. So if they don't believe they can financially survive, you know, paying that mortgage and all the expenses for that home in addition to a, a second home um, that they possibly moved into or you know, the house that they're moved into that they're renting, um, it, it may not be a good idea for them to lease their home. And here's something that's very important that we hear a lot. The rental market doesn't care about what your overhead is. The rental, I mean, market is basically what somebody is agreeing to rent for and somebody's agreeing to pay, okay? It doesn't, the, the market does not care what your principal interest, taxes and insurance, plus your HOA dues um, equals, and then tack on additional money on top of that for, you know, to come up with your rent amount. The, rent, the market is what the market is, so you need to prepare them. It may not be a positive cash flow situation for them, um, and they need to see if they're going to be able to survive on a ne negative cash flow scenario. And then the tax impl implications are very important as well. You just need to remind them that they must reside in the property two of the previous five years um, to be tax exempt on the capital gain from the sale of that property. So since they were owner occupying it, they just assume um, that they're going to be able to keep all of their net proceeds without taxes. But if it's does not, if they have not occupied that property two of the previous five years, they are going to have to pay taxes on that gain when they sell. Okay, now finally we're going to get to some do's and don'ts of property management. Um, perhaps some of you out there have thought about getting into property management. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there and quite frankly there's a lot of people out there doing it that are doing it wrong. Um, if you go to the Texas Association of Realtors and you ask about complaints against licensed individuals, more than any other complaint out there is property management. So if this is something that you're seriously considering doing, you know, this is just kind of a summary here of some of the do's and don'ts, basic do's and don'ts of property management. So what you want to do is you always want to stay informed. You know, stay up with the, the latest laws uh, because property management encompasses several laws that cover a variety of issues. And as it says here, the laws don't change often, but what they do, they're usually fairly significant. So you need to make sure that you have a way to keep in, keep up to date on the latest laws and how they're going to impact your, your owners and also your business. Okay, and as far as staying informed, uh, the, the Real Estate License Act basically says the term broker now includes a person who controls the acceptance or deposit of rent from a single family residence. And a business entity that receives compensation on behalf of a license holder must have a corporate broker license. These just went into effect 
September of last year. Um, uh, any business entity for which the designated broker owns less than 10% of the entity is now required to maintain E&O insurance of at least $1 million. Another thing you need to keep in mind as far as that goes is you need to make sure that, first of all, if you're not a broker, that your broker allows you to do property management because a lot of traditional real estate brokerages, their insurance does not cover property management practice. Um, so that is very important that you definitely check with your broker, or if you are a broker, you're going to have to make some modifications to your insurance coverage to ensure you are covered for property management. Okay, TREC rules. A broker is responsible for any property management activity which requires a real estate license that is conducted by the broker's sponsored salespersons. Now again, all of these went into effect last year. Um, a corporation or LLC owned by a broker or sales person, salesperson which receives compensation on behalf of the licensee must be licensed as a broker. And then finally, a broker is responsible for the proper handling of trust funds placed with the broker, although the broker may authorize other persons to sign checks on behalf of the broker. That's very important, especially if you are not a broker and you're doing property management. Um, we have to keep up trust accounts um, in our course of business to keep our rents received in, uh, to keep our security deposits in. So you need to be aware that those trust accounts are required to be in the name of a broker. They cannot be in the name of a uh, salesperson. Okay, and a person controls the acceptance or deposit of rent from a resident of a single family residential real property unit and must be licensed under the Act if the person has the authority to use the rent to pay for services related to the management of the property or the person has the authority to deposit rent into a trust or bank account and sign checks or withdraw money from the account. A uh, single family residential unit includes all of the following here. Um, ironically, it does not include a duplex, triplex, or four, fourplex unless the units are owned as a condominium, cooperative, row home, or townhome. Um, Again, these are just other things to, that you need to be informed of going into property management. And this is property code. Uh, Texas property code basically governs our relationship between landlords and tenants. So if you are very new to property management or leasing, you definitely need to go out and you need to start reading Texas property code. It's not the most interesting read in the world, but it will definitely keep you out of a lot of trouble to make sure that you're in full compliance with property code at all times. So what this is right here is just kind of a summary of the most recent amendments to property code. Um, House Bill 1111 requires the Justice Court on request to immediately issue a writ of possession without hearing if a tenant fails to pay the initial rent deposit into the Justice Court registry within five days of the date the, the tenant filed the pauper's affidavit. So what that means is if you evict someone and they appeal the uh, judgment against them, um, it's going to go up to the court and they have to put in that rent amount into the court's registry within five days uh, of when they filed that pauper's affidavit. So that's really important if you find out a pauper's affidavit is filed on you that you check to make sure that that tenant did put those funds in the court's registry. If you do not know what a pauper's affidavit is, again you need to educate yourself on the eviction process. Um, these are terms that you need to know like the back of your hand if you get into property management and leasing. Uh, we covered this a little bit earlier but House Bill 1168 updated the smoke alarm requirements where it need, you, know, you need to make sure there is one place in each bedroom, also one on each floor of the property and they need to be in the hallways feeding the bedrooms. Um, so you've got until January 1st to be in full compliance there even though it went effective September 1st of 2011. And then House Bill 1862 provides remedies to a tenant against a landlord if an owner's certificate of occupancy or CO is, is revoked. Now speaking of the eviction process, this link right here basically will, eviction courts are governed by the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. Now if you review these rules, 738 through 752, it'll give you an idea of how an eviction goes. So take note of that link go educate yourself on civil procedure so that you're prepared if you ever have to go to court for one of your owners. Okay, this has come up a lot when the real estate bubble burst a few years ago. 
Um, the purchaser, you need to know that this information as well in the event you're dealing with foreclosures as, as well. The purchaser of a foreclosed property must allow the tenant to remain in the property until the end of the lease. Uh, the exception is the purchaser must give at least 90 days notice if the lease is on a month-to-month -month status or if the purchaser intends to use the property as his primary residence. So that's really important information, but they also need to be, the tenant, what it doesn't say here is they need to be current on their rent. So they need to make sure that if a house is foreclosed on, they find out who the bank is and where to pay that rent going forward. Okay, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, this requires the landlord to provide an applicant with a notice of any adverse action taken based on information obtained from the applicant's consumer report. So if we do a background check on your tenant, like we talked about at the beginning, um, and there's any adverse action taken, meaning we've rejected the client, or the tenant, I'm sorry, um, or even if we have asked for additional deposit, we'll take the person but we'll ask for additional deposit, that's still defined as an adverse action. There is a TAR form, unfortunately I don't have the form number in front of me, um, an adverse action notice form that you can utilize for this. So make sure you're using this. If you have someone that is rejected um, or if there is something above the, the normal listed terms such as an extra deposit, uh, make sure that's being utilized. Um, a recent amendment further requires the disclosure of an applicant's credit score when the adverse action is based in whole or in part on the applicant's credit score. You know, some firms or landlords will utilize credit scores in their criteria or their process, others don't. So if it is, they'll make you aware of it on this adverse action form. It's very, very important in this business to keep very good records and maintain a really good sound set of policies and procedures for your company. Um, first of all, it's required by law. Um, and if you note here, you must maintain your records for at least four years in the event that Trek comes and wants to, to audit your files. Um, we never get rid of any forms in the you know, in, in today, with today's technology and the ability to scan everything, uh, we can keep everything infinitely. Um, but basically, it's another way to protect yourself if there's any fair housing complaints, um, and it provides evidence and documentation in an eviction case. And basically, like it says at the bottom here, it just makes your life so much easier. Um, document everything you do, and you will always, always be in a good place. Okay, tenant selection criteria. So at the time a rental applicant is provided with a rental application, the landlord is required to make available a printed notice of the landlord's tenant selection criteria and the grounds for denial. Now they're not required to provide that to you when you do apply, but if you request it, they're required to give it to you. So that's very important information. A best practice is if you do have a, your selection criteria, make it part of your lease application. That's what we do in our office is make that page one of our lease application and make them sign the bottom of it so they know what can, can get them rejected or what uh, negative items may result in, in a higher deposit having to be paid. You can find a model privacy policy and tenant selection criteria at the TAR website, texasrealtors.com. There's all kinds of great information on that website and on the property management um, link on that website. So if you haven't checked it out, I, I strongly recommend you go out there and check it out. Always make sure you're using the current forms. If you're using zip forms or the TAR forms, you're, you'll typically ha always have a library of forms that are up to date, but as a licensed individual you are obligated to use the current forms because property codes always changing and these forms are always staying up to date with, uh, with any law changes. And if you're using some expired forms, there's a chance that they may not have the correct language that are in compliance with current law. Um, again, keep up with the changes. You know, you can read Texas Realtor magazine, um, but I would, I would strongly recommend you, that you do go out to texasrealtors.com and read up on all the, the property management information out there because there is some really, really good stuff out there. And finally, here's the link on the Texas Realtors website so you can always keep up with what forms are under revision. Okay, this is a no-brainer no matter what business you're in, is establishing sound relationships. You know, maintaining a sound relationship with both your client and the tenant 
will help your business run smoother. It'll also reduce your headaches as well. You've got to set expectations, you know, have excellent communication on both sides, on the tenant side and on the owner side. Um, and it says it will also eliminate the pitfalls of property management, reduce problems for everyone. So sound relationships, excellent communication skills will make your life so much easier in this business. Here is the most important thing, is seek advice. If, if it is something you don't know, find somebody that knows it because you can get yourself in a world of trouble and your clients in a world of trouble if you act on something that you're not educated on. Um, so seek the advice of experts in the business, talk to your broker, talk to other property managers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the leasing and property management section of texasrealtors.com. It's a legal question. People always forget about the legal hotline. Those guys are great. Utilize that. You're paying for it. Um, the most important thing, I'm the president of the Dallas chapter of NARPM, which is the National Association of Residential Property Managers. Join NARPM. It will be the best money you ever spend. Um, you would be amazed at how open everyone is and receptive everyone is to helping you. I can guarantee you, whatever scenario you're dealing with, there are tons of people across the country that have dealt with it. And it is the most valuable part of uh, the property management world, in my opinion, is being a member of NARPA. We all know this, uh, commingling of funds is a huge no-no, okay? So if you're holding money belonging to another, that money needs to be in a trust account. So become familiar with the following rules on trust accounts. Basically here we have the difference uh, with the definition of trust account is any trust, escrow, custodial, property management account, or other account which a licensee holds money on behalf of another person. Um, you don't have to have more than one trust account, but it's always advisable, in my opinion, or best practice, to have a security deposit account and then also a, uh, an account to hold rents. So when you're collecting rents, you have your, you know, your rent account and then your security deposit account as well. Um, a broker may designate a salesperson as an authorized signer on a trust account. However, the broker is still responsible and accountable for trust funds. Okay, so that's very, very important information. Um, a licensee maintaining a trust account, again, must have documentation going back four years. Again, this just goes into more licensee shall not commingle trust funds with personal funds or other non-trust funds. That's a no-brainer. I think the majority of the people listening to this know this but we cannot hammer it home enough that you cannot co-mingle funds. Make sure they're separated at all times. Okay, it is permissible for a broker to establish a savings account as a trust account, uh, provided said funds may we be withdrawn at the appropriate time for dispersal. Um, I know that may sound like a no-brainer, but a lot of people think it has to be a checking account, and it doesn't. It can be a savings account. And in the absence of an agreement to the contrary signed by the person depositing the funds with the broker, any interest earned on a savings account must be distributed to the person or persons who are the equitable owners of the funds during the time the interest is earned. <coughs> what that basically means is you need to have that laid out in your property management agreement. And the TAR property management agreement does have a section that covers that. Um, but make sure if you're not using that agreement that you have that verbiage in whatever agreement you choose to use. Uh, we've said this earlier, a salesperson may not maintain a trust account. Um, those all have to be in the name of the broker. Um, and again, a broker may, but is not required to, maintain separate trust account for earnest money, security deposits received from the management of rental property and for other trust funds. Um, if a broker maintains a trust account, that account must be clearly identified as a trust account. So make sure at your bank you have it listed as, you know, XYZ company trust account or XYZ company security deposit trust account. Make sure that title is actually listed with the bank. Uh, don't delay. That's a, another no-brainer. Property code set, sets forth strict deadlines and time frames and allowing these important deadlines to pass will increase your liability. That's the same in sales as well. You know, Time is of the essence. Um, normal wear and tear. This is always a really, really tough subject to cover in our business. Um, you're basically prohibited from retaining any portion of a deposit to cover normal wear and tear. Normal wear and tear is defined right there um, in that next section. I'm not going to read all that. But basically determining whether a condition or repair constitutes normal wear and tear depends on the facts. 
So be sure you can support the deductions you take. <coughs> Excuse me. What that means is make sure you do all your documentation up front. Take a lot of pictures, take videos, document condition upon giving keys over to a tenant. Therefore, you can determine the difference between normal wear and tear or tenant negligence or tenant damage. Don't discriminate. We all know fair housing. It's been drilled into our heads since our very first real estate class. But as you are aware, the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in the sale or rental of housing based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, or handicap. So again, if you've been in sales your whole career, nothing changes. We follow the exact same rules in leasing. And again, don't manage property if you do not know what you're doing. You're going to get yourself in a world of trouble. You're going to get your uh, property owner in a world of, of trouble. And as a licensed individual, you have an obligation to competently manage a property for your client. If you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. And like I said earlier, don't be afraid to ask questions. We've all been there at some point, uh, but seek advice from others that, that you know and trust or other experts in the industry. And that's about it. That's going to wrap up our session for today. Um, here is my information. Don't ever hesitate to give me a call or shoot me an email if you have any specific questions regarding uh, tenant-landlord relationships, property management, leasing, or the National Association of Residential Property Managers. I hope you found this information beneficial, and I wish you the best of luck in all your future endeavors.